welcome, welcome. If you have not heard, we are on the move. God has opened an amazing door for Brushstroke Ministries and this show, One Brushstroke at a Time. He has given us an opportunity to move to another network and we are excited with this move. We are so grateful to Uplift for opening the door to us coming on to national TV. We are so grateful for that opportunity. Uh, they were, they've been, they've been great. I mean, they have helped us. They've guided us. They've taught us. They have coached us. They have been patient with us. And we just want to thank Uplift TV for the, the open door. They were obedient to the Lord and they, they ushered in this amazing move for us. And yet, there is still more to be done and more to do. And so we are moving from Uplift TV to the GEB network on DirecTV. It's number 363 on DirecTV. It's on cable systems. You can look up GEB Network and it gives you, uh, you can download an app. It's on Apple. It's on Google. Um, you, can, you can stream it. We are going to be everywhere and that's what excites us. That we're just a small ministry. You know, we're, we're, we're just a small ministry trying to preach his word. Doing our very best to get his word out to as many people as possible. And so this is an amazing opportunity to just be, you know, just a small town ministry in the world because this is opening up the globe to us. And it's overwhelmingly wonderful, but overwhelmingly humbling to be used by God in such a way. So we're going to be moving from Friday nights at 7.30 off of Uplift onto the GEB network on Sunday afternoons at 5 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock Central, and then continuing on through the United States. But 5 o'clock Eastern, we are going to be on GEB, which is channel 363 on Direct TV. So find us in the guide. Don't miss us. If you can't find us, if you forget, uh, just email mail or uh, drop a note to the, the ministry and we'll direct you to all the different ways that you can watch us. I think we'll probably end up putting all the different ways to watch us online on our website so that you can follow us and be with us. Our time is short. Our time is short. And to be able to speak the gospel into more homes, onto more devices, is just amazing for us. It has been a dream. It has been a, a, a desire of my heart to just preach his word. You know, I'm, I'm not a application kind of teacher where, I, you know, I'm going to teach you how to be a better wife or a better husband or a better mother or a better secretary or a better doctor. I, 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 I'm not in that application kind of place. My heart is just strict word. His word, his word, his word, his word. It doesn't need a lot of fluff. It just needs his word to be taught. And that's what my desire is. So if you would just pray for us during this transition so that the people who've been watching us for all this time will find us again and that God would open up new households to us, uh, that we can just impart his word into situations in living rooms and hospital waiting rooms and anywhere else that we can be found. Because where we can be found, he can be found. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, I have a message today uh, called The Early Settlers. The Early Settlers. Hmm. Why, why, why do we settle for so much less than God's best for us? I have done it in my life time and time again, where God has said, if you'll just wait with me and be a stand and let me, and I'm going to set the standard, I will give you what I've promised. I can tell you this, uh, for, for a couple of years, we were praying, I was praying for offices for brushstroke because we were outgrowing from my house, seriously, and we had to find new offices. 
And there was this, on the main drag in our town, there's just a main road that goes through it. And I wanted to be on this main drag, a lighthouse on a hill, right? I wanted to be there. And this one building went up for sale. And I thought, oh, that's the one I want. That's the one that God has for me. And it wasn't perfect. It wasn't magnificent. But it would suit us. It, was, it would be okay. And I would drive by and pray for it and believe for it. And then another building opened up two doors up. And I looked at that and I went, well, that's not quite wait. That one is perfect. You see, I was praying for the one down here, but my promise was two doors away. And where we ended up moving, we got for a, 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 just a song. I mean, God opened that so far wide that we got it for one third given to us, given to the ministry by the people who owned this building. Uh, it was amazing, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful inside, and all the work that was done was donated and given to the ministry. Uh, uh, we had so many volunteers, and these offices are just beautiful now. But I was ready to settle for this down here. But God said, don't settle too early because your promise is two doors up. And so we as a body of believers generally... Don't wait for God's best. We settle for less. We, we've been dumbed down to accept far less of what God wants to provide for us. You know, as long as we can live with less, we can deal with God's not best, right? If we can do it, we will. If we can just, you know, live on this much, oh, it's okay, God, I don't, I don't need more. This is okay. Now, that's different that's different than God saying, for right now, this is what I want you to have. That's different. What I'm saying is when God holds out something up here, and we're going to settle for something down here, so many people do that when they get married. They, they have a standard of who they want to marry, but they don't wait long enough. They think it's just been too long, and so they settle for someone who is not who God meant for them to have. And then trouble ensues in their marriage for years and years because they've settled. Listen, you have to be sick and tired of getting of being sick and tired before you would aggressively pursue God's best for you. You need to have a holy, H-O-L-Y, a holy dissatisfaction with the mediocrity before you can experience all that God has for you. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen accidentally. If you don't pursue God's best, you will never find his best. Let me give you a couple examples. In Numbers 32, the Reubenites, one of the 12 tribes, and the Gadites, this is important, settled for less than what God had promised. They had finally come across from the wilderness, 40 years of wandering, across the Jordan. They had defeated the people in this area, and they, they were ready to go forth into the promise that God had for them in the land flowing with milk and honey. And just as they get there, on the brink of possessing everything that God had promised, they decided... They decided, not God, they decided, the Reubenites and the Gadites decided that they were going to live on this side of the Jordan. Uh, this seemed perfect for them. It, the fields were suitable for their flock because they had a lot of flock. Um, they had defeated the enemy, so it was a safe place for their families. Um, it was a decision that looked almost too good to be true. It kept their, their children out of harm's way. They could settle finally. I mean, this was perfect. But what was wrong with this side of the Jordan? They were a people of covenant. And God wanted them in the promised land, not in the almost promised land. See, that's us a lot. We see a promised land and we think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll never be, God, I don't think God will ever do that for me. And so we settle for back here, the almost promised. The almost promised. They stopped short of possessing the land that was promised to them. 
The, the, they had run out the enemy of Jazer and Gilead. I mean, this looks great, but it wasn't what God had for them. What was wrong with that? What was wrong? Because it fell short of covenant promise that God had given them. Their destiny was not on this side of the Jordan. Their destiny was to rest in the victory that God would give them as an inheritance and not to settle for less. And worse than that, that kind of settling for less, that complacency is contagious. Let me show you this. This is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. Deuteronomy 32, verse 7. Now why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord has given them? <clears throat> That's what Joshua was saying to the tribes of Reuben and Gad. Why would you discourage the others by not going over with us? Do you know that a sure way, a sure way of stopping Christian growth is to hang around, to hang around with those who have a spiritual complacency or a spiritual stagnation or someone who doesn't want to pursue the best in God. They're just settlers. They're settling for less. They're just early settlers. But see, Moses and Joshua understood that complacency and settling is contagious because other tribes heard what Reuben and Gad were doing and they thought they'd be influenced. In fact, there were because the half tribe of Manasseh sided with Reuben and Gad. And so two and a half tribes, an entire tribe split. Now remember, a tribe was just a, a huge family unit and half the family stayed here and half the family went on. Do you understand that that is not God? That that is Satan's device is to divide families? He does it even now, divides families and puts some here and some over there and some in this denomination and some in that denomination and some home and some not. That was a ploy of the enemy. So you've been saved for something. And you've been saved for something great. Let me, you've been saved for something spectacular, right? Here, this is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23. Deuteronomy 6, 23. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore to our fathers. See, many of us have been brought out. We've been brought out of sin and depravity and we've been delivered out of addiction. We've been delivered from habits. We've been saved out of death. We've been saved out of uh, recklessness. We've been saved out of uh, rejection and all those feelings that we muddle through. We've been saved out. And we think that that's just where God wants us. Just, oh, I'm out. I'm out of hell. I've been saved. I won't be going to hell. But you've not allowed him to bring you in. I've been there. I have been brought out and have refused to be brought in. I was settling for so many things in my life. Settling for, well, I don't feel as bad today in my body that I did yesterday. So because I don't feel as bad, I, I, I'm okay. I'm okay. I can get up and go to work now. So, yeah, I still don't feel great, but I, I'm okay. Settling. That's settling. That is settling for less. God doesn't want you half healed. He wants you whole healed. He doesn't want you half delivered. He wants you wholly delivered. He doesn't want you half free. He wants you wholly free. But we're settling for just being brought out and settling for less. Now, let me show you some other settlers. Israel settled for a man named King Saul. This was not God's chosen. The king, according to uh, when in Genesis, when Jacob was blessing his 12 sons, he blessed Judah and he said, out of Judah, the scepter will come out of Judah. In other words, out of the tribe of Judah, every king will come out of the tribe of Judah. That's why Jesus is called the line of the tribe of Judah, because every king comes out of the tribe of Judah. So who does Israel pick as their first king? Not a guy from Judah, a man named Saul who was a Reubenite. He wasn't even Judean. 
and he was a disastrous king. You see, they couldn't wait for God to give them the rightful king because David was still a young boy. They, God wanted to be their king until he installed the right king. But Israel settled for Saul, and it was disastrous. Abraham and Sarah couldn't wait for the rightful heir. They couldn't wait for who would eventually be Isaac. And they settled for an Ishmael. And Ishmael and Isaac became enemies. The tribes became enemies. Arabs, Israelites, that's still going on today because they settled for what they thought was the promise of God. Israel again settled for being in Kadesh Barnea uh, instead when they could have gone to the promised land. Listen, they even wanted to settle for Egypt, then the promised land. Look at Numbers chapter 11, verse 5. Numbers 11, verse 5. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Here's what they were saying. They're going, oh, boy, I'd rather go back to slavery and eat, eat that. I just want to eat everything I want to eat. I don't want to go to the promised land where I might have to work, where I might have to toil for what we have. It was free back in slavery. That would be settling. Look at Psalm 106, probably one of the, ver the worst and the saddest scriptures in the Bible. Psalm 106, verses 24 and 25. The people refused to enter the pleasant land, for they would not believe his promise. They would not believe his promise to take care for them. Instead, they grumbled in their tents and refused to obey the Lord. Is that you? Could that possibly be you? That you refuse to enter into this amazing promise God has for you because you can't believe that he would do it for you or that you have stopped believing that, he's, that he promised it to you and life has gotten in the way and doubt and fear and years and time has come in between you and God's promise and so you go, I'm just, uh, I refuse to go. I, I'm just going to give it up. And then you settle for less than God's best. Listen, they even settled for Barabbas. They could have had Jesus, but they settled for Barabbas. Can you imagine? Can you, the, the solemnity, the solemnness with which that happened, that God is looking down and going, I have promised you the Messiah. I've promised you Jesus, and you choose Barabbas? For those of us who have been Christians for a long time, it becomes easy to think that we have exhausted the possibilities of God in our lives, right? Listen, we've all been there where we feel like we, we've just exhausted God's possibilities for us, that we can settle into routine of activities at church or in our small groups or in Bible studies where we stop expecting a move of the Holy Spirit every Sunday morning when we're together. We stop believing that visitors are coming to our church and, and that we've invited people and people will get saved every Sunday. We, we have stopped believing that promise that if we lift him up, he'll draw men unto himself. We've sort of given into the complacency and the easiness of not pursuing and, and aggressively going after God's best. We have little expectation. Be honest. Be honest. We have little expectation of anything new. The familiar becomes predictive, and everything from here and out is just more of the same. But, but, one of these days, we're going to stand before God, and in an instant, in a heartbreaking instant, we are going to know what we could have had while we were on this earth. We will understand that the same power that raised Christ from the dead was resonant within us all along. And that we will discover that we didn't have to be sick. That we didn't have to live broke. That we didn't have to be depressed. We didn't have to live a life of discouragement. That we didn't have to limp into heaven. 
crying, praise God, I made it. We're going to find out that we didn't have to live that way at all. That God had his best for us. Will, will you say this? Will you just say this with me? Lord, please, if this is my inheritance by the blood of the Lamb, I want to enter in. I want to go through it with you, and I want everything that you have for me. If this, all of this is our inheritance, Lord, I want everything that you have for me. Here is an audacious prayer. And I mean a big, fat, audacious, daring, I double dog dare you kind of prayer to pray every day. And it's in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know, to know that you know that you know that this love surpasses knowledge. That you may be, here it is, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's a prayer that Paul was praying, that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. Not just this much of God or this much of God, but the absolute fullness of God. Of God. That is a big fat double dog dare you audacious prayer. I dare us as a church to pray every day, God, fill me with your absolute fullness of who you are and what you have for me. God, don't ever let me live a day of less than you want me to have in that day. I dare us as a church to pray that. We begin to pray that, and God will bestow upon us graces and mercies and promises and blessings that we could scarce understand. Because first, you have to understand that no matter how much you've experienced God, no matter how much God is in you, there is still more, infinitely more to be experienced. You've only begun to experience the fullness of God. I guarantee you. Compared to the fullness of God, I've only tasted part of what he has from that what he has for me. That big audacious prayer jolts you out of mediocrity. I mean, it just jolts you out. Say a prayer, oh God, you know, whatever you have for me, I just bless you and praise you today for what you have for me. Lord, if it be your will that I, you know, that I get up in the morning, that I, this is not that kind of prayer. This is a prayer that will jolt you out of that mediocre kind of prayer life and go, God, God, how deep is the love of Christ? How to know, I want to know that love that surpasses what I can even imagine or think. And I want to be filled with the measure of all of your fullness. Pray that every morning. Second, this prayer assumes an extraordinary truth. It communicates the mind-blowing good news that you and I, you and I, have the capacity as a child of the king to be filled with God's own fullness. Not your fullness or mine, but God's fullness. It, it is an extraordinary truth that God would want to fill me with his fullness what is God's fullness? It's everything. It is literally everything, and he wants to fill me with that. Oh, saints of God, that we could grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that word, no, one of my favorite words in the Greek is gnosis. 
or gnosko, and it means to experientially know. Not just know in your head, but to experience. If I tell you it's raining outside, your head looks out and goes, it's raining, I agree, in your head. But when I say it's, it's raining and you go outside and you get drenched by the rain, that's gnosko or gnosis. That's knowing beyond just mind, but knowing, experiencing God. And so this is how this reads. To grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to experience over and over and over. To experience over and over and over the love that surpasses just what you know. And so that you can experience over and over and over again the fullness of the measure of God. Oh, hallelujah, the fullness of the measure of God. Why are we early settlers? Why are we settling early? I think for one of the reasons is that we're just willing to. We're, we're just willing to. Don't do it. Don't settle for less than God has for you. Be open. Be open to him. Be expectant. If you don't expect it, if you don't have an anticipation, you, you lose half the joy of getting it. Half the joy of getting it is waiting for it. Amen. God wants to fill you with an overflowing with all that he is and give you all that he has for you. He doesn't want you half sick. He wants you fully healed. He doesn't want you partially delivered. He wants you completely rescued. He doesn't want you half saved. He wants a, a, a recklessness uh, and, and a, a, in your salvation that changes you in a heartbeat from who you were to who he wants you to be. This is, the, this is what God wants. He doesn't want you to be half anything, partial something. He wants you to be whole, complete, sozo. That's what salvation is. Complete wholeness, healing, everything. That's what he wants. Stop settling for less. Stop being an early settler and being an, a, a, a late receiver. Amen. Listen, if you do not know this Jesus who wants to give you his fullness, fullness to live in you, will you let us lead him to you? Because this is an amazing life that he's painting this great picture of, your life with his, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.